Section 1. You will hear a talk between a student and an accommodation officer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Hello, how may I help you? Hello, my name is Martina Bila. I made an appointment to see you at 10 o'clock. I'm a little early. Is that OK? No problem. We're not very busy at the moment. You said on the phone that you weren't happy with your accommodation and were thinking of changing. That's right. May I ask what the problem is exactly? To be honest, there's more than one problem. The main problem is that the accommodation is further than I imagined from the university. I see. And the other problem or problems? The other problem is that the landlady is quite a heavy smoker. I'm a non-smoker and I'm afraid that I find it quite unpleasant. I'm sorry about that. Weren't you given the option of accommodation with smokers or non-smokers? I'm afraid that's really my fault. I don't mind light smokers, but I didn't get my accommodation organised very much in advance, so most of the accommodation had gone by the time I applied. However, a friend told me that there is sometimes accommodation, uh, you know, uh, accommodation becomes available mid-term because some people leave the university or change their place, uh, the place where they live, so I thought maybe... I see. Yes, it is important to arrange accommodation well in advance, though it isn't always possible. However, your friend was correct. We do get some accommodation available mid-term. Just give me a minute to find your details on the computer. Yes, of course. Now, your current address is 43 Parkway Drive, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that's a fair way away. The bus connection isn't too good either, is it? I think that it would be better to focus on that as the reason for moving rather than the smoking issue. However, I will change the information in the computer to say that this accommodation is only suitable for smokers or people who don't mind heavy smokers. That way we can avoid similar problems in the future. That sounds like a good idea. Now, the good news is that there is plenty of accommodation available nearer the university. The bad news is that it is more expensive. That's OK. I expected that. Is there any catered or self-catering university accommodation available? That would be ideal. I thought you might be interested in that. The day after you phoned, a place became available. It's catered, so it's the most expensive type of accommodation, but it's yours if you want it. There's no self-catering accommodation available? Not at the moment. Something could become available at any time. But then again, you might have to wait weeks. I understand. Can I just check the cost? It's £37.50 per week. You also have to pay £23.15 during the Christmas and Easter holidays, regardless of whether you are there or not. That sum doesn't include meals during those periods. But summer holidays are not included. That's right. Students are permitted to stay in university accommodation during holidays, but they usually have to move to a different flat. I see. And do I pay monthly? Yes, but don't worry if you're a few days late. It happens quite often and we don't mind too much. Can I see a picture of the accommodation? Sure. It looks like this. You can see that there is a single bedroom for each student and a common living room and bathroom. There are no cooking facilities, but many students buy a microwave. Can you tell me anything about the people I'd be living with? There are two girls there. One is British and one is Indian. They are studying law and marketing, respectively. They're the same age as you, 20, and they're not smokers. That sounds perfect. If I don't give my landlady a month's notice, she gets to keep the deposit, doesn't she? That's normally stated in the rental agreement, yes. I'd like to be able to keep this university accommodation available, but I'm afraid I can't. If someone else wants it and takes it... I understand. I'll take it. Can I move in on the first day of next month? What day is today? 22nd. Yes, 
That should be fine. Give me a minute to print out the standard rental agreement. That is the end of section 1. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Welcome everybody. Are you all sitting comfortably? My name is David Price and this is our first meeting in a series of presentations called Countdown to Departure. I know that you have just arrived here for your year-long course prior to going abroad, but it is certainly worth taking the time to consider, to think about events that will take place a year or almost a year from now. I have handed out this useful guide to planning your time abroad. Please follow the suggested timetable closely. It is vital that you get each thing done on time. If you can get things done earlier, then we suggest in the guide, that's great. But certainly don't leave them later than we recommend. If you do not get these things done on time, it could jeopardise your study abroad, or at least delay it by a year. Now, we are currently one year from departure, so you should start applying for postgraduate programmes and scholarships immediately, if you haven't already. Consult your tutors for further advice on these points. You should also calculate a rough estimate of your study and living expenses and consider how to pay for them. We'll be looking at that in more detail during the next meeting. You should start arranging accommodation abroad as soon as you have accepted a place on a course. Arranging accommodation can be a rather bureaucratic procedure and can take a while. At the same time, ask the university about your options for paying your fees. The next point on your timetable is six months before you leave. At that point, you need to check your passport and, if you are going to need a new one, deal with that immediately. Remember that your passport might need to be valid for the whole of the period you intend to be abroad, but that you can often renew your passport at your embassy in the country where you are studying. In any case, your passport needs to be valid for at least six months after you enter the country where you intend to study. It might seem unnecessary to get your passport in order so early before you go, but remember that you have to get your visa as well. You should do that around six months before leaving too. Bear in mind one final simple point. Make sure that your passport has a few empty pages left for visas and stamps. Two or three months before departure, you should ask your bank about the options for transferring money to the country you'll be studying in and setting up a bank account there. You should also start looking at booking your flight to the country you'll be studying in in order to get the best rates. The cost of flights varies considerably from carrier to carrier and even between different travel agencies and depend a lot upon the time of year you are flying. Booking in advance can save you a considerable sum of money. When you book your flight, you should check with the airline or travel agent to find out what your baggage allowance is. At the same time, look into booking your other travel within the country you're going to from the airport where you will arrive. Don't forget to buy travel insurance when you book any flights. Finally, still two or three months before departure, make sure that you have an unconditional letter of acceptance from the university you're going to attend. This is vital, as it facilitates entry clearance if into the country. Next, about one month before leaving, find out whether you will be entitled to receive free health treatment in the country you're going to and find out how much you will have to pay if not. Look into arranging health insurance if necessary. Also buy currency and traveller's checks to cover your first few weeks in the country. Watch the exchange rates and pick a good time, but do not leave it too late. If you are buying traveller's checks or a large amount of money of currency, your bank may need a while to arrange this. Another thing to do is find out what you can take into the country 
and what items are prohibited. Finally, find out whether your home insurance policy will cover your belongings while they are abroad. If not, arrange suitable insurance or look into the possibility of arranging a policy in the foreign country. The last point on this timetable is two weeks before you leave. At this time, you need to do two things. One is to ask your doctor to write a letter explaining any prescription medicines, what they are, and why you are taking them. The second is to request a reference letter from your bank in your own country, as this will help you to open a bank account abroad. Now, let's take a closer look at. That is the end of section two. You will hear a talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. Come in, everyone. The office might be a bit crowded with four of us and all these materials. There's coffee over there. Help yourselves. Now, we're here to discuss three types of learners. Kinesthetic, visual and auditory. And how we can teach each type. I gave each of you one of them to consider. Jack, can we look at yours first, please? You were assigned to kinesthetic learners, weren't you? Yes, I was. The first idea I had was using gestures, particularly finger gestures. Teachers can use them to emphasise stress on certain syllables. They can also use their fingers to write words in the air, spelling out the letters. The second thing is that the teacher can use the board. The teacher can ask students to spell words by going to the board and writing them up. The teacher could also ask students to write a letter each in order. The teacher could put a poster on the board and students could go to the board with labels and label it as directed by the teacher. Another possibility is to ask students to organise words into categories on the board. Good. The important thing is to keep kinesthetic learners active, moving. Games are good for them. Jack, did you think of any? Yes, Helen. I thought of a couple. One is like charades. Divide the students into two or three teams. Give the students on one team some words and ask them to act them out. For example, if the word is cold, a student might shiver. The other teams have to guess the words. Good idea. Simple but effective. Well done. Tina? Well, I was asked to think about teaching visual learners. Flashcards are good in my opinion. The students can guess words from seeing part of the flashcard, which can be a word or a picture. Or the teacher can show students the flashcards very quickly. Maybe that's how flashcards got their name. Flashcards can also have different background colours depending on which part of speech they are. Noun, verb, adjective, adverb, etc. Students could also learn from their peers by highlighting words they don't know in a text, for example, then asking, helping each other with unknown words. I know a good game for visual learners. Make a set of cards, half with words on and half with pictures. The cards are face down and students can turn over two at a time. If the word and picture match, they keep the cards. If they don't, they turn them face down again and the next student tries. Great idea. Visual learners are often good at categorising words. Each page in the student's notebook refers to a category of words. Students write new words on the correct page in their notebook for faster recall. For example, page 1 might be food and page 2 could be telephone phrases. Spider diagrams are good too. Yes, they are. Helen, you were assigned auditory learners. OK, I had these ideas for teaching auditory learners. First, they could listen to a dictation and draw what they hear. For example, 
students listen to the teacher describing items of furniture and then draw them in the appropriate rooms of the house. Or the teacher could describe a picture. After the description, the teacher and students can see whose picture was closest to the original. Flashcards can also be used. Each student gets a flashcard, and they hold up their card when they hear that word or phrase in a song, poem, or story. Another way of using them is to go around the class, with each student adding a sentence to a story, including the word on their flashcard. Auditory learners can also learn using songs and music. Any suggestions? The teacher could give the students a text of a song, you know, the lyrics with some words replaced by a rhyming word. Students then listen to the song and make corrections. That's a really good idea. Perfect for auditory learners. Well, thank you for your suggestions. I have a few other ideas you might consider. That is the end of section three. Now turn to section four. Section four, you will hear a lecture on note taking. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this class on note taking. Let's take a look at the basics first of all. The first question we need to look at is why take notes. The purpose of taking notes during a lecture is to help you to concentrate on what the speaker is saying and to provide you with a summary in note form so that you can write up your notes in full later. Also, it may be that the notes provided by the lecturer are not sufficient. The lecturer may add new information during the lecture, and your own notes will be needed to provide you with a complete record of the lecture. Taking your own notes will promote a deeper understanding of the content of the lecture. So, how do you take notes? The general principle in note taking is to reduce the language by shortening words and sentences. The following advice will help you to take notes efficiently, leaving you free to listen to your lecturer. Remember that these notes are for you, and as such, you can use any method you like, so long as it enables you to reproduce the ideas contained in the notes and show how these ideas connect to each other later. However, there are certain principles you should bear in mind, and certain conventions that are commonly used, which you may find useful. First of all. You must be able to determine what you need to write down. What is important to you? How do you know what is important and what is not? This is not an easy question to answer, but there are things you can look out for. The first piece of information you receive is the title of the lecture. This is perhaps the most important single piece of information of the whole lecture, so you should make sure that you write it down in full. Even better. Find out what it is beforehand, so that you can have time to think about what the lecture will be about. Secondly, listen for direct or indirect signals from the lecturer that tell you what is important. As a direct signal, for example, he or she may say, "This is important. Write it down," or "Make sure you get this down." Or he or she may make indirect signals, such as pausing before saying something important. Or saying it slowly, loudly, or with greater stress. Listen for repetition. When the lecturer repeats a point, go back to your first notes and add in any new details or information. When a teacher or lecturer recommends a student to read a book, it's usually for a particular purpose. The book may contain useful information about the topic being studied, or it may be invaluable for the ideas or views that it puts forward. And so on. In many cases, the teacher doesn't suggest that the whole book should be read. In fact, he may just refer to a few pages which have a direct bearing on the matter being discussed. Now, how should you write your notes? 
As mentioned above, you can make notes in any way that you like, but the following guidelines will help you to develop a style that is both quick and accurate. Concentrate on the important ideas. Avoid repetition and omit things that do not need to be stated specifically because only you yourself will be reading the notes and you will know what they are referring to. Summarize important ideas. You can use words that are not used by the lecturer to restate in a shorter form what he or she is saying. Write in short phrases rather than in complete sentences. Many students ask me when they should write up their notes. You might not have time to note down everything you want during the lecture itself, so you must rewrite them as soon as possible so that you minimize the risk of forgetting something. Finally, you should decide on a personal note taking style and be willing to adapt according to whom you are listening. For more practice in note taking, Take a look at these books which can be found in the resource room. Study Listening by Tony Lynch, particularly Units 6 and 12. Then there's Learning to Study English by Brian Heaton and Don Dunmore, especially Units 5 and 10. The first one is published by Cambridge University Press and the second one is published by Oxford University Press. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.